Let's click got it. Good. Well, a very big hello to everybody this oh, evening and very I big welcome <laughs> to you all to this event uh, on World Poetry Day. I mean, I'm sure I'm up. <laughs> I hear some voices there in the background. I'm going to mute them all. Are you going to mute them all? Yes, yeah. yeah. Okay. Oh. I muted you by mistake, Michael. I'm sorry. But I muted everybody. You, you, will you unmute yourself? Okay, here we are. Good. Okay, well, a very big welcome to everyone uh, to this very special event this evening on World Poetry Day. Today is World Poetry Day, and that's the occasion then for this event this evening, uh, where we will be hearing about reading Jared Manley Hopkins as a spiritual practice. Now, the event this evening is being hosted by the Spirituality Institute for Research and Education, which is SPIRE for short. And we have a website, and I'd just like, to, if you don't mind, just to show you the website briefly for a moment before we get going. So I'm going to hope I can get this now to do. So you'll have me share now this. No, I can try and share the um, share the screen. I'm clicking share screen, and here we go. So let's see. Can you all see that? Mm -hmm. And you can all see the screen? Yeah. Yes. Good. Okay. Well, this is the Spirituality Institute for Research and Education, or SPIRE for short, uh, website. We redesigned the website and launched the redesigned website on the 1st of December, just a few months ago, therefore. And you can all return to this website on your own time. I just want to draw your attention to it at this moment and let you know that it's there and it's worth looking at. You'll get information about what we do and about some of the events we've held and various other activities we have, such as the MA program. Uh, you have Frank here, of course, this evening, and then the MA program that we run in applied spirituality here in Dublin and various other events. But under the tabs then, you know, you get to know about the team, um, meet, uh, meet the team. And the, the team, we are a team of a few trustees Bernadette Flanagan, myself, uh, and Marie Dixon and Ruth Harris, we're the trustees of this. It's a charitable, it's a registered charitable trust. And then as well, you know, we have our governance documents there. So we're a registered charitable trust. And we have to comply then with the charities regulator and produce an annual report every year about ourselves and see that we're engaged in compliance with what's expected of a charity, otherwise we'd be wound up. And then under events, you'll get to see, if you click on the events tab, you get to see a lot of the events we've held in the couple of years that were in existence. I should say we came into existence in uh, June of 2015 or 16. God's hard to keep track of time. And then as well, the MA and Applied Spirituality program, it's doing very well. This program has been running for over 20 years in a few different places. It's currently running at Waterford, well, it's currently awarded by Waterford Institute of Technology. It's a program from there, but we actually run it in Dublin, Inspire Institute, and um, you can get information about it there by looking at that tab. Then the research tab tells you a bit about some of our research activity, and uh, we have currently a couple of people doing PhDs, uh, Diane Jackson, Liz Flett Murray, who's here this evening, and uh, Tara Travers, too, is meant to be here this evening, and so you can get to see a bit about that and some of the graduates that graduated with PhDs in the last couple of years. And then as well, um, I think you could just go to the very end of this page, if I remember correctly, we have all the research as you see. We have here at the end of the, you get a, a real flavor of the kind of studies being done by the MA graduates uh, in their research dissertations, which is part of their MA program. You get the whole range of kind of titles and topics that they're engaged in over the years by looking at this and Next, we'll bring on to the next set. There's about 83 entries in there at the moment, so they're obviously not everybody's there, but there's a very good flavor of what we do by looking at those research dissertations. Then under resources, then you get the Spire Library is a big thing. This is a specialist library that we run in Dublin in the Spire Institute. And uh, there's a library board of our operations committee, of course, and all that. But it's a specialist library for the study of applied spirituality. And uh, it really is catalog. We have a spirituality catalog as well for this. It's all the books are catalog in terms of spirituality studies. It's the first library of its kind in that way uh, anywhere we think really. And Bernadette Flanagan has done a great deal to bring that on. 
and Kath, uh, Catherine then, or, uh, Kathleen then is our coordinator of the library. Then, you know, you can see videos um, as resources. You can listen to videos here, talks we've given maybe in recent years, and the Pope when he was here and all that. Um, Noel is there too, giving one. So you can do, can do, you can, by listening to those, you get to see some of our resources, similarly with podcasts, as well as the videos, we have podcasts there and you can, here's one, for example, of the international conference that Bernadette and I were very involved in bringing, uh, bringing about uh, in 2019. And uh, then there's public lectures and then the links as well worth knowing because uh, the Spirituality Institute is linked with all kinds of organizations in different parts of the world engaged in spirituality studies. And it shows you the network that we're part of and really in any, some ways and some extent at the heart of. And then contact, you know, if you want to make contact, you have that there. But down here then there's an important piece and we haven't really got a newsletter going yet, but what this really is doing at the moment is anyone who signs up here gets onto our mailing list and so, for example, when we have events, and I send out a MailChimp, uh, the newsletter, well, the a notice about it goes out to everybody on the list. And in time, we'd probably develop a newsletter as well. So you want to sign up and you're not on our mailing list at the moment to know about events and possible newsletter activity in the future. You could, you could just, that'll come straight into me there then and you'll be on the mailing list. Okay, that's just to give you a flavor. At the top, these images refer to the themes of Spire, really. This one is spiritual care, then social concern, spirituality and leadership, spirituality and the environment, ecology, and so on. And the one over at the side here then is about spirituality and pilgrimage, which is a growing area in spirituality studies. Anyway, that's just to give you an idea of the website and I won't take up too much time just to introduce you to it and you can go to it again in your own time. So I just stop sharing that then and come back. Right, well, I'm speaking to you here this evening, really, from just around the corner from where Jared Mandy Hopkins did, lived and studied and taught and lectured and worked in the final years of his life, 1884 to 1889. So it's just a few minutes walk away from where I am here now to where he lived and, and, and worked in uh, University College Dublin, as we can call it. And he died in Dublin, as you know, uh, and is buried here in Dublin. So we're very much linked with Jared Mandy Hopkins. And it's very fitting, really, that we're able to hold this event on World Poetry Day uh, here now in honour of him. As you know, he died really without his work being known about and appreciated and recognised and all that. And uh, he would not have believed, I think, that we would in 2022 be hosting this event, uh, commemorating him really in some ways as a world renowned poet, which he certainly wasn't recognized and known about uh, in his lifetime. So uh, it's great that Frank is a Jesuit in Fordham and myself a Jesuit here in Dublin and that, uh, you know, Hopkins being a Jesuit as well. Uh, he, it's great really too that as Jesuits we can kind of commemorate one of our own, so to speak, on World Poetry Day and that I'm coming to you from Dublin and Frank is coming to you from New York. And uh, Noel, who's handling the IT side is in Carlo. And of course you yourselves are coming from different parts of the world and from many parts of Ireland as well. And we have many people here this evening from different states of life and from different many professions and many organizations. Uh, and so it's wonderful really, we've, we have such an array of participants in yourselves uh, to mark this occasion. So uh, at this point, then I think it's appropriate for me to hand over to my colleague, uh, Dr. Noelia Molina. Noelia is the current uh, program leader of the MA, and she serves on the governing board of the International Society for the Study of Christian Spirituality. And we're honored to have here tonight from that society, which is really the leading society for the study of Christian spirituality in the world. We have two past presidents, uh, Lisa Dahill in California and our own Bernadette Flanagan in Dublin. And then we have Frank, of course, from the board. My, my I've served on the board. Noelle is currently serving on the board. And we have the incoming president of the society, Bo Karen Lee in Princeton here this evening. We have Chad Trawls as well from the society here this evening. Hi, Chad. And uh, so we have great representation from the society. Uh, so Bern uh, um, Noelia 
is going to introduce Frank, since they're both connectors in the governing board of the International Society. And it's, uh, I'm very happy now to ask Noelia to introduce uh, Frank, our speaker, to us for this evening's event. Thank Noelia, you. Thank to... you, Michael. Thank you. Great. So uh, we're really delighted. Can you hear me here? Yeah. We're yeah. really delighted to have Francis here with us uh, this evening. And what Michael said, uh, uh, Francis um, is an associate professor of Christian spirituality and Ignatian studies at the Graduate School of Religion in Fordham University in New York, where he is the director of the Doc Christian Spirituality and Spiritual Direction. Now, before Fordham University, Francis served as associate professor of Ignatian spirituality the Jesuit School of Theology in Santa Clara, as in Berkeley, in California, and as an assistant professor as well in religious studies. And we're both board, as Michael said, of directors of Society of the Spiritual Christian Spirituality, where Francis serves as a liaison between the board and the editorial board for Spiritus. Spiritus is the journal of the Society for the Study of Christian Spirituality. And Francis is very well published on the poet. I mean, some of his publications will include 40 Day Journey with J.R. Macklin Hopkins, The Language of Poetry as the Foyer, The Theopoetic Aesthetic of J.R. Hopkins, Reading for Transformation Through the Poetry of J.R. Macklin Hopkins, and J.R. Macklin Hopkins and the Story of the Church of England, a Christianity and Cultural Resource. And Francis' culture, uh, current uh, research and writing uh, will include a lot of methods and critiques of disability studies. And he really focuses upon the critical interpretation of the social, the medical, theological, and spiritual constructs of disability, as well as exploring pastoral strategies for accompanying persons living with chronic illness or disability. So one trajectory of his work is proposing possibilities for a spiritual affiliation among the disabled and um, able communities through prayer, but of course, poetry and the arts. So we are certainly we're very excited for your presentation, Francis, and delighted to hear it. So I'll pass it all over to you now. Thank you, Noelia. Thank you. Good to see you outside of the board meeting context. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Let me see. Get this out of the way. Okay, so uh, first of all, I have to apologize for my background. It actually was a joke uh, because this past week was uh, spring vacation here at Fordham. And so uh, I did not leave the Bronx, but I put up this spring break like beach scene. Uh, I'm a native of South Florida, so it's sort of spoke of home to me as well. So I hope it's not distracting to you because I have no idea how to get rid of it. Uh, so good evening uh, to those in Ireland and good day, good afternoon to those of us uh, in the States. I thought uh, before I launched into my talk that I would sort of lay out what I was going to uh, do. And so uh, I'm going to focus on three of Hopkins's poems that are sort of generic, uh, come from three different sort of areas of interest for him. So the first one we'll look at is a sonnet of despair or a dark sonnet. The second one we'll look at is a nature poem. And the third one we'll look at is uh, a poem from his own uh, life, uh, how he lived uh, his life during parts of his time uh, as a Jesuit. So the poems themselves, for those who know Hopkins, uh, the first one we'll look at is To Seem the Stranger, Scenes My, Li my Life. Uh, the second one is Pied Beauty, one of my favorites. And the third is going to be Felix Randall. So I'll probably spend the largest uh, or the greatest amount of time on the first one, simply because I'm going to use it uh, to lay out this sort of method that uh, I'm proposing. And then with the other two poems, uh, the engagement will be much briefer, and, um, and then we'll open it up for uh, questions and comments. Um, and let me just say that the heuristic device I'm using, 
or the, the method uh, actually comes from uh, Paul Ricoeur and Sandra Schneider, but it speaks of worlds, the world of the text or the content of the poem, uh, the world in front of the text, that is the uh, engagement with the poem by the reader. And uh, the third one is the world behind the text, if you will, the text, uh, excuse me, the context and the composition of the poem. So you may rightly ask why I'm choosing this order of things. It's because I want to mirror our experience of poetry. First, we read it. As we read it, or when we finish reading it, we have uh, several emotional or intellectual reactions to what we're reading. And then if we really like the poem, we may start investigating who was its author, what was that author, author's life uh, context from whence they came and their culture and what's going on in the world at their time. So the hermeneutical circle for the spiritual consideration of poetry uh, assumes it's not a lockstep or static manner of interpretation. As most of you I'm sure know from earlier uh, years of studying poetry in secondary or higher education, each poem that we read is not simply read once and then digested, right? Instead, each poem requires repeated chewing, if you will. Uh, a first encounter with a good poem demands more readings, second, third, fourth, and many more. Given this penchant for a creative style, rhyme, repeated vowel and consonant sounds, let alone his love for neologisms, Hopkins's poetry is especially challenging to the first time reader. And when I say reader, I mean what Hopkins himself insisted upon. Poems are to be read aloud. The verse sounds contribute to understanding the poem's sense. No silent internal reading of poems is allowed, although that's what many or most of us did in school. Voice within the poem comes alive when we voice its, con uh, its content. So for reasons of explication, as I said, we'll spend most of our time with Stranger and then we'll move on to uh, the other two poems. So as defined by Sandra Schneider's, the object of reading for transformation is to go beyond simply discovering what the text says to asking if what it says is true, and if so, in what sense, and what the personal consequences for the reader and others might be. In my usage of the term, reading for transformation is a heuristic for describing in part the spiritual engagement with poems. Stated simply, within the context of an individual's faith journey, spiritual readings of poetry potentially open us up to spiritual uh, consequences. So Noel, at this time, I'd ask you to uh, pull up the uh, text for To Seem the Stranger. There we go. Let me first uh, just read it and uh, offer some initial uh, comments. Uh, I have to confess that Noel very generously set up these um, uh, pages for us, and I didn't know he was going to use one of my books, The 40-Day Journey, so um, uh, that's not, not meant to be uh, an advertisement, although I suppose it is. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Here we go. To seem the stranger lies my lot, my life among strangers. Father and mother dear, Brothers and sisters are in Christ, not near, and he my peace, my, porting, my parting sword and strife. England, whose honor, O oh, all my heart woos, wife to my creating thought, would neither hear me were I pleading, plead nor do I. I weary of idle of being, but where wars are a rife. I am in Ireland now, now I am at a third remove. Not but in all removes, I can kind love both give and get. Only what word wisest my heart breeds, dark heaven's baffling ban bars, or hell's spells thwarts. This to hoard unheard, heard unheeded, leaves me a lonely began.
often when someone prays or engages a poem spiritually, things start to happen. For example, one can quietly enter into a poem by reading it and encounter familiar themes, thoughts, ideas, or what have you. But very quickly, it starts tapping into one's life. The encounter with To Seem the Stranger is very specific to Hopkins, each of the three removes he mentions there, and uh, we'll spend more time in that later, but basically uh, he feels removed from his family because he was raised an Anglican, but as a young adult, he uh, swam the Tiber and became a Roman Catholic, let alone a Jesuit. Uh, and then uh, the second part of his remove is uh, how his poetry that he's writing uh, just as the culture won't accept it. It's not getting published. It's not well liked or well understood. And then, of course, a third remove is that uh, he ends his life in Ireland and uh, he has a very challenging and difficult time there uh, because uh, it was a time of Irish nationalism and he was uh, very much the Englishman, even though uh, working in Ireland at a Jesuit Ireland. Uh, an Irish Jesuit uh, apostolate. So he really struggled with uh, the students uh, singing nationalistic songs and uh, complaining about uh, Great Britain and all that sort of thing. Our connection, there is a connection between poetry and spirituality because they are both speak to common human experience within our spiritual traditions. The status of a poetic encounter as a marvelous and resonant site for self-expression, worship and prayer, reflection and revelation, perhaps even the possibility of spiritual transformation. Essentially, successful poetry grabs us. It lovingly embraces us or shakes us up, or it simply takes us somewhere. So also sexual, uh, sexual spiritual experiences grab us. Put another way, poetry by its very nature is a very intimate literary genre. Poems invite us into their own words, worlds, and wonders. There is, as one critic put it, a twinship between the writer and the reader in poetry. The words of the poem become the reader's words. Poems are volatile. They attract us. Sometimes they challenge us. Other times they seduce us, other times they provoke us. We are drawn into their wor worlds, sometimes against our will, and at other times with our willing acquiescence. Poems are sites for conversation, critique, and query. Sometimes they expand our world, at other times they may subvert it. And throughout our encounter, there is the potential for self-transformation. It is this possibility for transformation that makes possible, I believe, the dialogue between poetry and spirituality. The poetics of spirituality may in part be characterized as the study of a specific event, the ongoing contextualized interior and relational encounter mediated by the poetic text between an individual and their ultimate reality. In the spirituality context, the poetics of spirituality assumes a radical openness to the experience of God. In the academic study of the poetics of spirituality, it is important to distinguish two distinct yet related operations. The study of a poet's spirituality through literary, historical, theological, and other lenses, and the spiritual engagement with a poet's poetry in the service of one's own spiritual journey or spirituality. Well, my work clearly involves the former, the latter is also important. This is an important distinction because due to its essential interiority, the spirituality of an individual per se cannot be the object of direct study. So in other words, we cannot know directly Hopkins's uh, spiritual experience. We only know it through the artifacts uh, that have survived his uh, letters, his journals, his homilies, and so forth. Thus, while much of what has been written on Hopkins's spirituality and uh, presumed spiritual experience 
through the investigation of his poetry and other things. What I am arguing for is an interdisciplinary method for engaging the poetry on multiple levels. Such an engagement is a meeting of worlds, my world with the poem, the poem's world with me, and uh, the world behind the poem, in other words, the, the context out of which uh, it, was, it was written. All of these are mutual communications and interrogations that take place between the poem and the poet and the reader. In spiritual engagement with poetry, there's an overlapping of the reader's experience with that incarnated in the poem by the poet. What one meets in this process is partially the experience thus concretized by the poet and partly the experience of the reader thrown in this way into sharper relief by light from a new angle. In a spiritual context, those who spiritually engage poetry open themselves first to the possibility of a spiritual experience and perhaps subsequently to some form of personal transformation. So let me now return to the text of To Seem the Stranger. I'm going to skip a little bit here. The world of the poem, so just the text that we're engaging here, speaks to the content of the poem. It is its linguistic and textual form. So this is the first way that we encounter a poem. Here it is appropriate to consider what the text is doing, how it does it, and whether it does it well or badly. While the text of To Seem the Stranger serves as a witness to Hopkins's personal experience, this same poem is first and foremost as its own language. It is written discourse, and as such, it stands always against the backdrop of a vast unsaid to which it is related. The semantic autonomy, the, the way it works together as a unit uh, of the poetic text, as well as whatever surplus of meaning uh, sort of is extended from it, are both essential aspects of our study. So, um, no, no, I'll get to that later. <laughs> uh, to seem the stranger is often approached through the lens of Hopkins's biography for obvious reasons, because it clearly speaks to his experience. However, to read the content of the poem, we have to be careful not to read it through the lens of what we know of Hopkins's life. That's saved for another uh, step in the interpretation. In other words, we let the poem speak for itself. It has a voice. If you will, once the poet writes a poem and uh, finishes it, uh, he lets the poem go and the, po the poem takes on a life of its own. Even though it's rooted in uh, the poet's experience, we now 150 years later can read it from the, our own experience. Not that there's a one-to-one -one correlation, but that uh, the meanings and feelings in the poem can be appropriated by each of us. So for example, consider the poem's discourse of displacement, estrangement, and alienation. These are three experiences that, regardless of one's time and place, are common in the human experience. Through the artful use of language, structure, and mood, the poetic voice, so the voice of the poem as we read it, uh, has its own meaning. The poetic voice announces and then repeats a theme of estrangement. To seem the stranger lies my lot, my life among strangers. It is the mournful pronouncement of a painful self-perception. The poetic speaker asserts a double estrangement, a stranger who is surrounded by strangers. This double estrangement is rhetorically sustained by a chasmus uh, uh, of stranger, lot, life, and strangers. In other words, a rhyme scheme of ABBA, producing an effect that is almost, but not quite, symmetrical. The resulting sound and sense of disequilibrium is evident in the poem's opening line and is then continued throughout the poem. Now let us acknowledge that for first time readers of the poem, 
we are all strangers, strangers to the poem's structure, its sound and sense. We do not yet know the poem, it is a stranger to us. Our estrange estrangement with the poem is itself an experience of estrangement. It is our lot as interpreters to enter as best we can into the poem's painful world of disequilibrium. The opening verse quickly introduces us to that world as we enter it. If we focus upon the first reference to estrangement, Hopkins's religious conversion as an Oxford undergraduate, in his own life, following a period of change and crisis and fragmentation as a young undergraduate, Hopkins chose to abandon the Anglican faith of his parents and siblings in order to become a Roman Catholic. It is clear from the exchange of letters between father and son that the elder Hopkins, while hoping for personal reasons that his son would remain an Anglican, was also anxious about the practical implications of his son's conversion. Gerard, on the other hand, perhaps typical of a 22-year-old eldest son, brushed off his father's concerns, assuring him that conversion was his only viable option. The estrangement between son and parents, however, was short-lived. After he entered the Jesuits, Hopkins maintained an ongoing relationship with his family through letters and occasional visits. As the poem indicates, however, the son's religious estrangement from the family never completely disappears. Those who were near and dear to him were nevertheless counted among those from whom Hopkins felt estranged. The fourth and fifth lines of the opening stanza established the radically Christian context of this particular estrangement. Parents and siblings, though they were in Christ because they were Anglicans, they were nevertheless not near because he was a Catholic. The poem indicates that his familial and religious estrangement was for Hopkins an incarnation of the biblical mandate that a disciple of Christ must choose faith over family. Now, what about the world in front of the text? In other words, what's our reaction uh, to, the poem, to the poem? So the consequences. Through the interpretive engagement with the poetic text, the reader enters into another world that is a world projected by the text. This world of meaning into which the reader is invited opens up new possibilities of meaning. In the critical engagement with the claims of the poem, the reader brings along their questions, their concerns, and their critiques. A dialogue ensues between the world projected by the poem and the world of the reader. In this process of dialogue with the poem about its subject matter, the reader as interpreter engages with the poem on multiple levels, and in part, both surrenders to and struggles with it. A potential, but by no means necessary outcome of this process of appropriation is a dramatic or fundamental shift of the reader's world or understanding of their world. The world of the poem and the world of the reader fuse into a horizon of new understanding, perhaps even a transformation of the reader. As I sometimes say in the classes when I teach Hopkins, uh, it's not only the reader that reads the poem, it's also the poem that reads the reader. It is at this level of estrangement with the poetic prayer text that what I have to offer is purely subjective, uh, suggestive rather, and subjective, I suppose. In Christian spirituality terms, here is the reader response uh, experience. Uh, the space and place and time in which we engage the poem as ourselves and looking at the poem's context, contents, and consequences. Reading for transformation, encountering this poem as a spirituality text, invites the reader into a place of possibility and potential, certainly a space of insight and awareness, but also potentially into a way of being in the world. In an effort to concretize what I'm suggesting here, let us consider the poem's power and energy, if you will, the sort of circulation of energy within the poem. Hopkins in his poetic, religious, and aesthetic theory talks about inscape and instress. A poem's inscape is its form, structure, language, rhyme, and rhythm. In other words, it's the poetry uh, that, 
or the lessons we learned when studying poetry. Note that in this poem and in pretty much all Hopkins poems, this is not a static category, quite the contrary. Hopkins intends by Inscape a dynamism a voice and internal working. And to seem the stranger, its inscape is its sonnet structure, its run on uh, lines, its sounds, its rhythms, its rhyme. This poem's inscape includes language such as my lot, my life, the deer, not near, and a life of strife. Here is a voice that both cries and parries, were I pleading, plead, nor do I. Here is a frightening, confounding, and frustrating inscape of impotent breeding and demonic resistance, dark heavens baffling ban bars, and hell's spells thwarts. And here also are those marvelously haunting concluding words, to hoard unheard, heard unheeded, leaves me a lonely began. In Hopkins's poetics, this inscaped energy within the poem is simultaneously in stressed. That is, in addition to the internal energy of the poem, there is also an outward reaching energy, which, hint, which lunges towards the reader, grabs hold of the reader, and demands attention. In one sense, here is the sacramental quality of the poem, its ability to represent and represent, and perhaps even incarnate for its reader the mystery and meaning that it projects. Now, who among us, and certainly who within the Christian community, has not at some point in their lives confronted experiences of estrangement, alienation, and displacement? Is there anyone here who has not at some point or at multiple points in their lives felt every bit the stranger in a new situation with new people and perhaps at times with oneself? In this poem, Hopkins's alienation is, is expressed in terms of parents, England, and Ireland. The particulars differ for each of us, yet one might suggest commonalities in the human experience. Struggles with one's siblings and parents, one's vocation and job, with one's society and culture. As a spirituality text, this poem, its inscape, its structure, and it's in stress, the sort of meaning as it uh, moves towards the reader, is a voice of estrangement, alienation, and displacement. This is the horde unheard, heard unheeded, that cries for breath, the ex human experience of estrangement in all our lives. Now, let me just say a few words about the world behind the text, what uh, gave rise to this poem. I've already talked about Hopkins's uh, relationship with his father and the religion of his uh, family. And let's remember this is in the 1870s, so a very different ecumenical context than the world we live in today. And so that uh, particularly in England, uh, it was quite a radical shift to move from uh, the Church of England to the Church of Rome. And so that's why it was such a major transition uh, for Hopkins. <clears throat> so where does this poem come from? What's going on uh, that gives rise to it? Now, this uh, type of investigation is a tricky business. On the one hand, we must keep in mind the admonition that authorial intent and historical context are not determinative in the interpretation of poems. In other words, on one level, it doesn't matter what Hopkins intended in writing the poem, right? Uh, in any poem we read, uh, we are not bound by the poets, the authors' uh, intentions, right? As I said earlier, once the poet finishes the poem, and uh, of course Hopkins didn't send these out to be published, but they, they were published 50 years after his death, but uh, they assumed a life uh, all their own. And so they have a voice of their own as well. But on the other hand, we know that those who spiritually engage poetry, and this is very true with Hopkins, establish bonds of friendship and trust uh, with the author. If you like Hopkins' poet, poems, you tend to also have a fondness for, po uh, for our, uh, Hopkins the person. It seems that once we discover a poem that speaks to us, 
we often develop a desire to know more about the poem's author and their social historical context. What is true in human friendship is also the case with poetic prayer. We are enriched insofar as we know and understand each other. So as a historical and literary artifact, this poem is open to a variety of investigations. A list of, uh, to list only a few possibilities, we could focus on Hop Hopkins's biography. We could look at his use of scriptural references or his own uh, sense of conflict with the Victorian culture of which he was a true and blue member. For example, if we return to the poem's expression of personal and social engagement, we click quickly encounter the stranger's sense of marginality as a personal experience and as a social construct. One person has uh, spoken of Hopkins as the wrong man in the wrong place at the wrong time, all throughout his adult life. To seem the stranger itself suggests that three points of biographical interest, as I've already talked about his relationship with his family. Secondly, his relationship with uh, English culture and literary society, because he never was seriously published during his lifetime. And even uh, the friends with whom he shared his poetry on the whole uh, appreciated that it was amazing, but they couldn't understand most of it. And thirdly, his relationship to Ireland's people, religion, and culture, which was not an easy one, as I said earlier. For Hopkins, each one of these relationships is a site of profound alienation and estrangement. Uh, another uh, commentator has made the uh, observation that uh, for Hopkins, who of course uh, eventually became a, uh, an English Catholic person, uh, the, in Ireland, uh, the, uh, the people of Ireland were the correct uh, religion, but the wrong culture. Because he of course thought that English culture, British culture was superior to any other culture on the planet. So uh, the British had the right culture, but the wrong religion. <laughs> so, so that's in a sort of a very quick and uh, uh, not so easy way, just describing uh, these three different moments in the engagement with uh, a poem, beginning with the world of the text, uh, its contents, and then moving to the world in front of the text, its consequences for the reader, and this is where the poem reads the reader as much as the reader reads the poem. And then thirdly, the world behind the text, the biographical, historical, critical, uh, the social elements that inform uh, the poet's uh, world, the world in which the poet lives, which on one level is a shared experience of many other people in his own uh, context, but obviously also very personal and private to his own experience. The process of hermeneutical engagement with the text of a Hopkins poem involves the critical, responsible, and ongoing research of one who wishes to explore the rich possibilities for using certain poetry as spiritual texts. Overall, it is my hope that if the text of such a poem is sincerely engaged with on the level of faith, hope, honesty, and openness, then the method for investigating a text, which I have set forth here, might shed some small light of understanding and explanation upon the possibility for a human a hermeneutics of spiritually transformative poetics. Now in the um, Q&A portion of uh, this talk, we'll have an opportunity to come back to this poem, as well as the other two, uh, to engage any comments or questions any of you uh, may have. But as I said in my introduction, what I'd like to do now is to move to the second uh, poem uh, that I want to look, like, look at. And so, Noel, you could uh, pull up uh, Pied Beauty. Why is my? It's on the screen now. <clears throat> no, this is my laptop is That's okay. acting up, not you. Okay. Um, 
So first, let me just read it. And again, uh, many of you may be familiar with this poem. It's uh, uh, anthologized uh, quite a bit. Glory be to God for dappled things, for skies of couple color as a brinded cow, for rose moles all in stipple upon the trout that swim, fresh fire coal, chestnut falls, finches wings, landscape plotted and pieced, fold, fallow, and plow, and all trades, their gear and tackle and trim. All things, counter, original, spare, strange. Whatever is fickle, freckled, who knows how, with swift, slow, sweet, sour, a dazzle, dim. He fathers forth whose beauty is past change, praise him. This lovely, what Hopkins called a kirtle sonnet, because it doesn't follow the usual uh, shape and pattern of a sonnet, because it's only 10 and a half lines and uses a unique rhyme scheme, is celebrating uh, nature and is one of his favorite ones. The sounds, rhymes, images, and all around beauty of the poem invites us into a realm of multiple images, including clouds and fish scales, chestnuts and finches, and then moving into human created effects of landscapes and labor, and including concluding with the song to the grand variety of all creation. At the beginning and the end of the poem, it is clear that the praise of God is the focus of all this natural celebrating. Although our focus with this poem is its content, let me first invite you to jot down some of your own experiences of this poem, whether this is the first time you've heard it or uh, the hundredth time you've heard it. In other words, I'm asking you today, what was your response to hearing the poem? Your, the consequences of the world in front of the poem. My hope is that at the Q&A period, uh, some might want to return to these reactions to the poems and we can uh, discuss them further. So let me just pause for a few seconds to give you a chance to think up a couple of things and jot them down. So turning now to the world of the text, notice how the sounds, rhymes, and images tran transport us into a world of beauty and activity, all in the praise of the divine. The content of words and images carries this beauty and action, but so also do the fascinating sounds with the, within the poem. Notice how the first two lines establish the mobility of nature's beauty. While in the moments of observation seemingly unmoving, the blue and white brinded view of clouds against a blue sky point to their slow but steady movement across the horizon. So also the rich red stippling of moles upon the bodies of trout swimming in water. I've been informed by true fisher people that uh, when you catch a trout and uh, reel it into your boat, uh, the redness of those moles begins automatically to fade. So there's an added sort of richness to uh, having referring to the uh, fish as swimming. The sense of the natural movement is then accentuated by watching chestnuts fall from their branches and the flight of finches' wings. The poem then expands its view to include a distance view of plowed fields. Here, imagine the swaying straw yellow of fields of wheat, abutting fields of rich green grass of pastures. Notice that it is the effects of human effort that create the quilted beauty of a farmer's labor, fold, fallow, and plow. Lastly, there is the focus upon the results of human labor involved with industry and fishing. The final four lines expand the reader's vision to focus upon the broad categories of difference and change. The poem has moved from focusing upon specific objects and movement to celebrate a countercultural emphasis upon difference, a theme which was not a popular one in the Victorian era in which Hopkins lived. Here it is the diversity that is celebrated, not uniformity. For example, all things counter, original, spare, strange. 
It celebrates uh, the changeability and inconsistency, the unpredict unpredictability of things, whatever is fickle, freckled, who knows how. Followed by a series of binaries experienced through a sense of sight and taste with swift, slow, sweet, sour, a dazzle dim, and concluding with a parallel to the opening line of the poem, God's glory. He fathers forth whose beauty is past change. Praise him. Note here that even God isn't static or unmoving, but instead is always fathering forth. That is, God does who God is. In the Christian tradition, God the Father acts as father for all of creation's beauty and variety. In terms of sounds, it's amazing the quantity of consonant sounds that are found in there. For example, with C, we have couple, color, cow. With S, we have rose, moles, stipple, swim. F, fresh fire calls, coal, falls, finches. P's, plotted, pieced, plow. And T's, trade, trackle, tackle, and trim. Note the rhythm pattern of the opening sestet, ABC, ABC. Things, wings, cow, plow, swim, trim. It's clear that the patterns and sounds of this poem dance together in a party marked by joy, celebration, diversity, and activity, all in praise of the divine. Let me offer some quick words about the world behind this text. This poem was composed by Hopkins while he was studying theology in preparation for his ordination as a priest. During this period, he lived in the north of Wales at a place called St. Binos, which is even today open as a Jesuit retreat center. He composed the poem in the summer of 1877, a time perhaps when Hopkins was happiest during his Jesuit life. While the more mundane studies of moral and fundamental theology occupied his studies, he spent his free time walking for hours in the valleys and high heels, hills surrounding the area. Because St. Binos was high up one of those hills, one can imagine Hopkins looking down on the valley below and enjoying the fields of diverse colors and textures. And now we'll move to the final poem. If my laptop will. Okay. And so this is uh, Felix Randall, another favorite. So again, I'll start by uh, reading it aloud and then we'll just pause for a few seconds so that you can think about uh, your immediate reactions. And then I have a few words for it. Felix Randall the farrier, oh, is he dead then? My duty all ended. Who have watched his mold of man, big boned and hearty handsome, pining, pining, till time when reason rambled in it and some fatal four disorders fleshed there all contended. Sickness broke him. Impatient, he cursed at first, but mended, being anointed and all, though a heavenlier heart began some months earlier, since I had our sweet reprieve and ransom tendered to him. Ah, well, God rest him all roads ever he offended. This seeing the sick endears them to us, us too it endears. My tongue had taught thee comfort, touch had quenched thy tears. Thy tears that touched my heart, child, Felix, poor Felix Randall. How far from then forethought of all thy more boisterous years, when thou at the random brim forge, powerful amidst peers, didst fettle for the great gray dray horse as br his bright and battering sandal. So just take a few seconds to Think about your immediate reactions to that poem. So now let us look at the world of the text. Note the curious structure of the narrative of the story. 
It begins with Felix's death, then moves into his period of sickness when Hopkins is ministering to him as his priest. It then moves into Hopkins's personal reflection on his ministry, if you will, his friendship with Felix. And it concludes with memories of Felix as a healthy, working, uh, ad, uh, strong man. One can only ask the question, why? Begin with death and move into life. Sounds a bit Christian, don't you think? Notice also the repeated consonant and vowel sounds throughout the poem. The vowel sounds like watched, mold, man, bone, hardy, handsome, or pining, pining, time, reason, rambled, and. But also the consonant sounds, such as seeing, sick, us, and dears, and tongue, taught, touch, tears. All these sort of hidden elements of the poem is what gives the poem life and energy. Note too the rhyme scheme. A, B, B, A, A, B, B, A, C, C, D, C, C, D. So in the first stanza, ended, contended with the internal rhymes of handsome, some. The second, mended, offended with the internal rhymes of some, ransom. Endears and tears. And randall, years, peers, sandal. All these and more poetic elements of the poem add to its sound and sense. Now the world behind the text, its context. This is an 1880 poem written while Hopkins was a church uh, priest in Liverpool, England. It was a relatively consoling time for Hopkins. Obviously he had been ordained, especially when he was at the beginning of the ministry. As the poem suggests, he enjoyed pre priestly parish ministry, especially visiting the sick and dying, as well as making friends with parishioners. One might add, even though they were mostly Irish. Sadly, one reason Hopkins is in Liverpool is because he did not get a fourth year of theology studies. In Jesuit parlance, so this is back when he was in St. Pino's before he was ordained. In Jesuit parlance, he was short coursed. Likely this was due to his interest in the Franciscan philosopher, John de Scotus, who was not a favorite of his Thomistic, Thomistic theological faculty. It is suggested by some that during his final exams, he made the silly mistake of referring to SCOTUS, which was a big no-no in uh, the college situation in which uh, he worked. Another possible expl explanation for his short course was the burgeoning demand in England for parish priests to minister to the many Irish immigrants into England's industrial cities. Again, this is the 1870s, 80s. The Catholic bishops of England were hard pressed to evolve from a relatively small church, a minority of Catholics, into decades of Irish immigration, requiring additional churches and large ones at that, as well as priests to serve them. Hopkins's stay in Liverpool was relatively brief, primarily because the demands and stresses of such hard pressed ministry exhausted him. Also, it was a very polluted city because of all the industry that was going on there. And one can only imagine that the author of Pied Beauty would soon become rather dejected and depressed by living in constant uh, pollution. That said, it's clear from Hopkins's letters home and to his dearest friends that the role of priestly minister was life-giving to him. Subsequent research indicates that Felix Randall, he altered the surname, uh, was an actual parishioner who died and was buried while Hopkins was serving at that church. Clearly, Hopkins formed a special attachment to Felix, acting not only as a sacramental minister, but also as a caring, concerned friend. More than one commentator has observed that a huge phys physical and intellectual contrast existed between Felix and Hopkins. As the conclusion of the poem indicates, at his prime, Felix was handsome, healthy, and strong. Whereas during his whole life, Hopkins looked and sounded like the English Oxford intellectual that he was, of small build and frequently complaining of poor health and delicate constitution. So in conclusion, of course, there is much more that can be said about this poem as well as the other two we've looked at, but our time has 
now uh, shifted to the Q&A period. Let me conclude with the hope that our reading these three Hopkins poems offers one possibility for a sort of transformative spiritual engagement with non-biblical texts. An assumption throughout this process of analysis is that one's journey through the cycle of interpretation is not nearly enough. Repeated encounters with the various worlds surrounding a poem will flower into ever new, ever inspiring friendships and fascination with the spiritual reading of the poetry. Thank you. Thanks very much, Frank. That's, that's great. Uh, we'll just maybe take two minutes or so just to give people a chance to compose any questions or comments they wish to make. And then we'll start the Q&A. And Bernadette Flanagan, who is the chair of the Spirituality Institute, uh, she will um, conduct or coordinate the, the Q&A. And I refer there earlier to the SSCS, the Society for the Study of Christian Spirituality, that international society, and these, the people who are present here this evening, will have the leadership. I uh, want to mention that also present is Rachel Wheeler, who is the treasurer and secretary of the society. And so a big welcome to you too, uh, Rachel. Okay, Bernie, I suppose we can proceed. Welcome everyone. So we have two ways of engaging with Frank's talk. Thank you so much, uh, Frank, and for the spaces in the talk as well to uh, gather our own reflections. So uh, there's, as you know, at the bottom of the Zoom screen, screen, there's a chat button. So if you prefer to write your comment or reflection uh, to share with Frank, you can put it there. Or if you prefer to speak, across the bottom of your Zoom screen. Just after the chat, you have a reaction button and you could click on that. And one of the options there is to raise your hand. So uh, I'll move every second turn between the chat button and the hand button in order to uh, raise reflections for Frank, if that's okay. So thanks everyone. So. Uh, even during the talk, uh, some people were busy and put in uh, questions uh, during the talk for Frank. So maybe I'll take one of the comments uh, from the questions uh, to start the discussion, Frank, if that's okay. So this uh, comment comes from Mary Ellen Sheehan. I don't know if you wish to speak it yourself, Mary, or will I read it out for you? You can read it out for me. Okay, Mary Ellen, thank you. So uh, Mary Ellen asked if you might comment on the dark sonnets in the later years of Gerard Manley Hopkins' life. And in particular, did they reflect in some way a kind of dark night of the soul in his life? Yeah, that's a great uh, question. And actually it's a, it's a current focus of mine in my <clears throat> recent work in disability studies. So uh, the five or seven so-called uh, dark sonnets, uh, which basically speak uh, to uh, a spiritual desolation, um, have been interpreted various ways, right? Some, some have interpreted them as uh, midlife crisis poems because uh, he's in his uh, 40s uh, when he writes them. And it's during one of the periods that he's in Ireland from 86, uh, 1885 to 89. So they've been read through the lens of like Ignatian uh, spiritual desolation, uh, but some have used John of the Cross uh, methodology to look at them. So uh, as a dark night of um, the spirit of the soul. And so I think one could do that. Um, another uh, way of interpreting it uh, is to uh, what I'm doing is to propose 
that he also was a person suffering from a, uh, a chronic illness or a disability. And so I'm not negating the earlier approaches to the poetry, uh, but uh, as we know, in the same way that there are spiritual and uh, psychological elements to uh, our daily living and how we live our life, so also there's a physical element. And so it's been proposed by one medical researcher that uh, given all the symptoms that appear in Hopkins's journals and letters, is that he more than likely had Crohn's disease. And so he would have lived with that seriously uh, in the, his adult years. Although officially he's listed as dying of typhus and indeed typhus may have killed him because Crohn's, which of course was undiagnosable and therefore untreatable in the 1880s, uh, Crohn's of course weakened his immune system and um, made him more vulnerable to disease. Was, was he ever diagnosed as a manic depressive? Yeah, no, of course, you have to remember in those days, uh, the Christianity in general, not just the Catholic Church, were very suspicious of uh, sort of the new theories of psychology and so the rumblings of Freud and, and those mm -hmm. colleagues. So that would not likely have been uh, an option for him. Now, he presumably would have had a spiritual uh, advisor or confessor, and he could explore um, uh, some psychological elements in there, but I don't think it would have been highlighted just from what I know of the Victorian period. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mary Ellen, for teasing out that element with us. Now I see Niall Matthews' hand raised, so Niall, you'd probably like to speak a reflection. You're on mute at the moment. The unmute button is probably at the bottom left hand corner somewhere. Or is Noel, Noel are you able yes, to? I have, yes, I have it, yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah thank you. Sorry, I, I, I'm, I have done it now. Thank you. I, I, uh, thank you very much. That was very interesting, fascinating. Uh, I, I'm, uh, I'm calling from Belgium. Uh, I, I have uh, one like observation and one question. The observation was about Pied Beauty. And uh, this um, phrase, landscape plotted, it seems almost like a painting. Mm. Uh, and you can imagine some other elements being incorporated into a painting. Mm -hmm. And then the, the question is, is, uh, is to ask about uh, the punctuation. Mm. In, in uh, the first poem, there was a, uh, a very unusual grave accent on strangers. And then perhaps not so unusual the double spacing after the after the period, and then in in uh, the other poem, there's uh, uh, an acute accent right. often used. So, so uh, I wonder if I could ask. That. Thank you. Sure. No, a great uh, a great question. Uh, this is still the current uh, official uh, publication. Uh, it's the poetical works of Jared Manley Hopkins, edited by Norman Mackenzie. However, a new edition is shortly to come out in the new multiple volume uh, edition of all of Hopkins's uh, writings. And not surprisingly, the last edition, the last volume is of his poetry because uh, frustratingly, uh, Hopkins, of course, poets always are coming back to their poems and uh, uh, working with them, but he liked to add the accent marks, marks on the poetry uh, to indicate how they should be read, uh, because very often he preferred a rhyme scheme which did not follow the norm, particularly in the Victorian period. And so, of course, I spoke them with my horrendous American accent, but um, they always sound better when it's an Irish person or an English person reading them to my ear. Um, but yeah, so that's part of the problem. There are multiple uh, copies of each of many of the poems where he has different markings uh, for accenting. And this is true also of uh, his, his uh, huge text, The Wreck of the Deutschland. So yeah, he was, he was very focused on sound. And uh, he also was into music and he tried his hand at composing, um, uh, but that never really went anywhere. So yeah, so there can be uh, interesting conversations among uh, uh, Hopkins scholars on the proper pronunciation 
of each of the verses. So that's a great uh, notice. Now, I don't, I don't remember if the editions that were posted had any of the markings on it. They may not have. Well, thank you, Niall, for drawing our attention. Uh, to the, the particular versions that were used when we're reading. Um, David Rensberger, I think, uh, do you want to ask your question directly or uh, will uh, I close? Sure. Yeah. Or out of that. Uh, and let me, in fact, uh, say in my career, I was a scholar of the Gospel of John uh, in, in seminaries, Protestant seminary, and was quite familiar with Sandra Schneider's. Uh, uh, hermeneutic, so it was very interesting to see it applied to Hopkins poetry. That's refreshing. But my question was um, uh, just interesting. I know the better known Hopkins poems, Pied Duty, Felix Randall, and so forth. I was not familiar with Stranger. And I wonder if in that poem, he is expressing a sense of himself as counter, original, spare, strange. Does pie beauty in some way, is it, is it Hopkins' way of saying, I really do have a place on earth. I'm all, all this other strangeness that God has made. Yeah, I think that's a marvelous interpretation of it. Now, whether he uh, uh, intended that, I can't say, but we could certainly interpret it that way uh, because uh, he is a man of variable interests and skills and abilities. Uh, many at which he was successful, but also many at which he was a failure. And uh, the most difficult part of his life is that he spent all, much of his free time composing poetry, and yet nobody seemed to like it. Even his best friend, a fellow by the name of Bridges, would often, you know, Hopkins would send him, oh, here's a sonnet I just wrote. And uh, Bridges write, would write back, I have no idea what this sonnet is about, because Hopkins loved to use such uh, awkward and different uh, phraseologies, neologisms like father and forth. Um, and uh, he loved uh, the study of language and words. So he very frequently used words that were not even used in his time, which were more medieval in uh, practice. And uh, so, yeah, I think that's a, a great way of looking at the poem. And I also, I meant to say to the earlier uh, commenter that uh, I also think you could read the poem through sort of a pointillist perspective, because I think that's very much in there, the way he's just, uh, as is true with the painters, the way he's just uh, looking at so many things at once and sort of using all these different, not points of light, but points of experience and activity and nature as being expressive of, uh, of God and God's beauty. So, so both of those, I think, are great examples of how working with poetry today uh, is just as fascinating as it would have been for Bridges. And certainly at this time of the year in this part of the world where spring breaking forth, it's a great time to yes. you know, have this poetry now swimming around uh, in our minds after this evening in our hearts. Uh, in that context, Mary Lennon uh, asks an important question maybe. Mary, do you want to speak to it or will I call it out? Mary, sir. Okay. Um, okay, I, I, can, I can speak to it. Yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you very much. Very interesting talk and for all your insights into the poems and the poet. Um, I was just wondering if you could speak, expand a little maybe on the, the general concept of reading poetry as a form of spiritual practice. Yeah, uh, now when I was a doctoral student, uh, Sandra Schneiders was my teacher. She directed my uh, dissertation, so that's why I used her uh, methodology, and she's the first to introduce it to me. Um, so, and of course, she was a, is a Johannine scholar as well, uh, before she moved into uh, Christian spirituality as an academic field. And so I always enjoyed the way, and she has books on this, uh, the way she interprets the various scenes in the Gospel of John, and um, the different events and encounters that Jesus has, let's say, like at the woman at the well. Uh, Sandra offers a fascinating uh, reading of that whole uh, narrative. But so I just simply took what she was doing with scripture and started to uh, apply it to 
non-scriptural poetry. And what gave me a partial inspiration there was that in the American version uh, of the liturgy of the hours, in the back of each of the four volumes, uh, they include a collection of poetry. Now, uh, much of it is explicitly religious poetry, but then some of it is not. It's just poetry about uh, beauty of nature and things like that. And so those two uh, things are what really got me looking at the possibility of could I uh, propose a, uh, a critical existential engagement with poetry that could lead not only to understanding and even aesthetic pleasure, but also to spiritual transformation. And so I'm not saying that transformation is a necessary outcome. I'm just proposing that it's a possible outcome. In, in my own life, uh, when I was a doctoral student uh, and uh, I was studying at the University of California, Berkeley, and within the English department, and uh, the professor I was working with uh, uh, su suggested that, why don't I read the poetry in different ways, encouraging me to do it. And uh, a Jesuit with whom I was living, when I told him about that, he said, well, why don't you pray with them? <laughs> And I just thought that was such an odd thing to say or to uh, suggest. And at the time, I didn't know much about Hopkins. I just knew what, uh, what any Jesuit generally knows about him and his famous poems. Uh, but so I decided to do that. So I spent a year every morning taking part of a poem or uh, an entire poem and really doing Lexio Divina with it, mm -hmm. as one would do with scripture. So reading, meditating, uh, uh, eventually maybe even contemplating on it. And admittedly, on one level, that's easier to do with Hopkins because he's so explicitly uh, Christian in his poetry, even in poems that he, where he doesn't mention Christ or God or the Holy Spirit. Uh, but I would argue you can do it with an a-religious uh, poet as well. So like Mary Oliver, who for most of her life, for example, was not a religious person. Uh, I find her nature poetry uh, just lovely and um, very similarly touches my, my heart as well as my mind uh, when I read so much of it. So I really wanted to offer a way of saying that reading poetry is more than an academic or um, literary uh, critical experience. It also can be uh, I more often use the word prayer, a prayer experience, but which could also be another word for the spiritual reading. And of course, in the spiritual reading, the reader brings uh, his or her own religious faith or belief into the interpretation of the text. So one doesn't obviously doesn't need to be a Catholic, let alone a Christian, to uh, appreciate um, Hopkins's poetry and enter into sort of that world that he projects uh, with his poetry, because it's a world uh, saturated with divine's presence. And uh, so as, as well, as long as someone has a sense of ultimacy in their lives, I think they can, I would hope they could engage the poems on that level. Thank you very Thank you. much. Um, I thought Lexio Divina came to mind and uh, Mary Oliver is one of my favorites. Oh. And I would say that I pray with poetry a lot myself. So now I feel I feel affirmed in my own practice. So yes, thank you very you much it. for that. Thank <laughs> That's you. That's great. Yeah. Thanks, Mary. That's great. Stephen uh, Costello. Stephen, maybe you'd like to oh, come in there. Thanks, Bernadette. Hi, uh, Francis. Thank you so much for, for a lovely talk. Um, I was just so struck by the Ignatian imprint of Hopkins, despite his Franciscan influence because as you're reading the poems out, it's very much savoring the word. And that reminded me of Ignatius Sentirse, to feel oneself into the language mm -hmm. and into the wording. Uh, and I would agree as well so much with the last speaker, uh, the notion that poetry can be a form of prayer and a form of Lexio Divina. Um, and and th there's a beautiful symbol from Eric Vogden's philosophy, the flow of presence. Mm -hmm. And when you read, um, Hopkins, like Wordsworth, you get that sacramental sense of this flow of presence that runs through all things. 
so I just thought that was beautiful and and finally I remember years ago saying to a Benedictine monk that I'd met Paul Ricoeur when I was doing my doctorate on him and he said oh I don't like him at all and I said why and he said he writes like a Jesuit so <laughs> Some connection, perhaps, between Paul Ricoeur and the Cheshire. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks so much, Stephen. That's great. I'm really sorry now that we're, we're running down in time and we probably have just space for one more comment. Uh, Judith, would you, Judith Watt, would you like to speak to your comment? Um, I went on retreat at St. Binos ah, and I had a really bad spiritual director. And so I ended up in the library with Hopkins because you're there and it's just all around you. And I, I was just, I got yelled at at the end because I had done something with my time. Um, and I just wondered why the Jesuits did, are so anti Hopkins there. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I know, but I mean, this, this, I don't think, I mean, it was a person learning how to do spiritual direction who had failed the year before. He probably should have been kicked out. Right, and yeah. he, I actually then went to Europe the next year to see if this was Jesuit because it was my first Ignatian retreat, and it was just a, it was a disaster. Oh, and I'm sorry to hear that. People from a, a a lot of people were there that were ordained, and they sort of saw what was happening. Hmm. Um, but it was just I was so mad at being yelled at for engaging. At least I got something out of the retreat. I got to be where Hopkins was with all the Hopkins. I could see the original books in the library that he read and. And I thought, I have to do something for 10 days. <laughs> yeah, I, I did a retreat there in the summer of uh, 2000. And uh, uh, it was just such a beautiful place to be. And I was immersed in Hopkinsian world. And so it was just uh, marvelous to walk around uh, the different, uh, not just within the building, but also the long walks that he went on uh, when he had uh, free time to do that as a seminarian. Uh, I, I suppose that's a risk of going to a retreat house and being directed by a trainee who uh, uh, is making mistakes that are not being caught by whoever's in charge of the directors. But I'm very sorry to hear that happened to you. And I, I hope you give uh, Ignatian spirituality another try at a different place. But oh, I went, no to Vienna. I went to Vienna. Ah. The, the, that, that was I've been going on retreat for more than 50 years that was the worst retreat ah. of my life ah. and then I went to Vienna the following year it was the best retreat of my life mm -hmm. so I knew it wasn't a Jesuit Ignatian thing I knew mm -hmm. it was just the worst spiritual director in the world maybe <laughs> even when I was a novice doing my first experience of the 30-day retreat the spiritual exercises one of the uh, fathers on the on the bishop team uh, every day would post a poem on the bulletin board. There was nothing else on the bulletin board because we were all in silence and nothing else was going on but the retreat. And uh, most of the time they were Hopkins poems. And I uh, just really loved that. The one, the one line that stayed with me all these uh, years, this is my 40th year as a Jesuit, um, is from the Wreck of the Deutschlands because when we were entering into the fourth week of the retreat, which is about the resurrection, uh, yeah. He just put up there, uh, let Jesus Easter in you. And I have just always loved that line. And uh, it would be a marvelous, a marvelous line to pray with when you're doing the fourth week, uh, the meditation or contemplation on divine love. So I'm all for reading poetry during retreat. As long well, as I, think, I think as Jesuits, you should take over St. Binos and there should be a Hopkins retreat thing i mean if jesuits are doing yoga why aren't they doing hopkins right yeah i don't know because they they used to have a room there that they set aside do they still have it uh sort of po uh, posing uh uh that it's the room that hopkins would have lived in and then there was a, an exhibit in the basement ground there was the there was the exhibit in the basement i didn't oh. see the room i was there just when they were renovating and making things oh. ensuite yeah but the library was there yeah well good for you for uh, hunting out the library. And of course, it, it's a Jesuit apostolate, so there must be Jesuits uh, there. But the uh, Jesuits that were there were really more interested in smoking. Okay. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> we, we could go further here. So, uh, 
Can uh, I? I'm, I'm conscious uh, that there are a lot of important uh, contributions in the chat. Is Noel there? Are we able to capture? Are we able to save those, Noel, and share some of the resources? I think we that should. Are... I think that happens automatically. You're, you're well, I've just, I've just, uh, I've just selected them all and saved them here in a board document. And, oh, yeah. good. So, may and I, then in terms may... of, yeah. Oh, 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 one sorry. second, I'll just May check I... something. I just check okay. something with Michael Bow and I'll be back then. Uh, Michael, are you, are you sending out a link to the recording afterwards or is Noel doing yes, that? Yes, we'll be sending, sending out a link out. tomorrow. We'll be sending out a link tomorrow. Okay, so <coughs> uh, Bo, uh, and then uh, yes. you just have to wind up. Yeah. Yes, thank you. I'm sorry. I am, I am um, on the phone right now and I can't put it in the chat box, but I was curious about the, the the person who just mentioned, you know, this horrible experience you had at a retreat center. I was curious, were they resistant to Hopkins or were they resistant to using reading material at all? Because I've been to silent retreats where they don't want us to fill our mind with words, but they want us to be apophatic as much as possible. So they're against reading of really hard, any kind other than Scripture. So I was curious if it was anti-Hopkinism or anti-words and anti-books, anti-reading, anti-poetry, if you, you if you have an idea. Okay. It, it seemed to be that they were anti-me going outside of the spiritual director, but I realized he did not, I don't think he even knew who God was. He was so off. Okay. Pat, I mean, okay, okay. Thank yeah, you. And, and, I mean, I, I had to do something while I was there. And they also had James Martin in the library, who I email back and forth with, you know, like a lot. Okay. And I needed people I knew were on track with God. Could okay. I just say, I was in St. Binos in 1980 and thoroughly enjoyed it. And Jared Hughes was my spiritual director, and I'm still benefiting from that experience. So I'd hate to think that things had, you know, deteriorated, but. Thank, thanks, Norma. Okay, so there's a lot of experience to share here, uh, definitely. So thank you, Noel, for capturing what's in the comments. If you want to add anything else to the comments now that may be helpful uh, to the other listeners this evening, that would be great. But I'll hand back to Michael then to close the evening. Thank you so much to everyone. And thank you, Frank, for extending uh, our appreciation as well through all that response. You're welcome, Bernadette. Thank you. Absolutely. So, Frank, uh, before we finish, then Andrea is going to offer a few final comments. Andrea is one of our MA in Applied Spirituality graduates. Uh, she is also part of the Spirituality Research Group we have that was formed recently and uh, that Bernadette had a lot to, to do with bringing about. And she's an author herself and is also very familiar with Ignatian spirituality. She's very involved with the Alan Carter Spiritual Accompaniment Training Program. So I'd like to invite her now to say a few concluding words for us. Thank you, Michael. And the first thing that comes to mind is that famous line, the world is charged with the grandeur of God. And I feel we are charged with the reflections and the sharings this evening. And I feel so alive and uplifted that I'm here with over 100 spiritual seekers from all around the world. So um, a big thank you to Frank and Spire and for all of the people for here tonight. I could talk all evening, but unfortunately time is against us. And I want to just say on behalf of Spire, a very big thank you to Frank. Um, thank you, of course, to Michael, to Bernadette, to Noelia, and to um, Noel for keeping us connected. And I would really encourage people to sign the mailing list for Spire because I know an awful lot of things are happening. And if we want to keep connected as a, a great spiritual community, um, this is a great great resource that we can do that. I want to chew and savour the words for longer. And I think I'm going to Easter in Hopkins. That are, that's my final reflection tonight. But thank you. My heart is full and I've really had a great evening. Thank you. Very many thanks, Frank. Thanks to everybody. Great to see. Well, there were about 140 people, I think. And they All had right. Oh, great. It's I just, my, if I could have a final word, it is to say my favourite retreat centre, of course, is the Jesuit Retreat Centre in Dublin. Manresa. Okay. Manresa. I was just there a couple of years ago. It's great. Oh, good, Frank. Yeah. Right. We love you back, Frank. <laughs> and that lady who had that awful experience in Binos, she could come and do a retreat with you in Manresa in Dublin. There you go. And you come out then and walk around Misa Hopkins around here, the uh, whole locality where I'm coming from. 
So listen, everybody, many, many thanks to you all. All the best. I'm so to see you again soon. Uh, God bless all. Thank you. Bye and very best, Frank, for being in touch. Bye. 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 Thanks very much to Noel for all that work with the you, registrations and IT. Thanks. Thanks, everybody.